The uh, topic this afternoon is to talk about the effects of system grounding and probability of arc flash reduction. That was the topic given to me. So we'll talk about how system grounding affects arc flash. It's a, uh, so to get the, everybody on the same page, let's talk about the methods of system grounding first. What choices do we have? The first one is that you have um, no intentional connection of the power system to the earth. I have three phase, three wire distribution on a delta delta transformer and this will be called an ungrounded system. The system has, is floating. The equipment itself is uh, bonded to the earth. It has ground electrodes and full grounding conductors. But there is no power system connection to the earth. So the discussion today is on system connection to the ground and not about bonding and grounding. So we are not discussing electrodes. We are not discussing bonding. We are discussing how the system gets connected. Okay, And these are the choices. So second choice would be that instead of floating it, we will rigidly connect it with a copper bus bar. So we have a solid connection with copper to the ground. Now the system is solidly grounded. You could also take a corner of the delta and connect it to the earth. That will be a corner delta grounded system. It's three phase three wire, but it is solidly grounded. So on the schematics, if you just say three phase three wire, it doesn't really explain the distribution. You have to say three phase three wire with qualification of what kind of grounding. Then it describes your three phase three wire system. So three phase three wire here is solidly grounded. Three phase three wire here is ungrounded. Or if you take the corner and take it to ground, it will be three phase three wire solidly grounded. You can also take the middle phase of the delta and ground it, and that will be mid phase grounded. Such systems can give you 120, 240, and 240 volt three phase. So you have a solidly grounded 240 three phase four wire, but the mid phase of the 240 is grounded. We don't normally use those kinds of systems. What we normally do is take a corner of the, of the center point of the star, the neutral point, and then take that to the ground. And then neutral becomes a grounded conductor. And we distribute the neutral. That allows us to put fourth wire in the distribution, giving you three phase four wire load. So it services 347 volt lighting and 277 volt lighting. So we use three phase four wire distribution primarily for single phase loads. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So if you take mid-phase grounded system, the, it becomes a convenient distribution, for example, for a rural distribution for a farm. You can give the farmer a single phase 240 for his house, and it will give him three phase 240 for his farm machinery. So that's an example of how mid-phase grounded could apply. So exactly to that end user, you find some municipal distribution systems in the United States which are mid-phase grounded, three-phase. Three wires, so yeah. you could supply three wire systems with mid-phase grounded transformer, and that gives you local distribution for farmer. We normally have, in our case, in Canadian distribution system, 347-600. In the US, they have 277-480. Now, if, if you don't connect the neutral solidly, but connect it through a resistor, then you have a impedance grounded system or resistance grounded system. A resistance is a very effective form of impedance to use because it's easy to make, easy to apply, and it doesn't create any resonances which uh, reactors do. So in comparing impedance grounding with a reactor and a resistor, resistors are dissipative and not creating any resonances. So therefore, they are preferred. They dissipate power. So if your system is floating and ungrounded, it's really coupled to the earth by the distributed cable capacitance. And the capacitance that exists not just in cables, but everything else you have connected to those a, B, and C with reference to ground. So VFDs, search protective devices, motor windings, they all contribute to this 
capacitance, which can be represented as a lumped capacitor connecting it to ground. So if I make the assumption that the length of cable is identical in the three phases, and the capacitances to ground are identical for phase A to G, B to G, and C to G, then these capacitors will give me equal reactances to ground. Therefore, equal value of charging current will flow, which will be 120 degrees apart. So when it adds up, it will be a net zero current in the ground. So I have two charging currents, but there is nothing, no current flow in the bonding conductor. So bonding conductor is at the bottom here. So no bond current flows in the bonding conductor, but there is a continuous current flow through the dielectric all through the distribution at that voltage. Now, if I have insulation breakdown on one phase, the B phase is beginning to have insulation failure. It was sitting in the center. The ground was sitting in the center of this triangle, equal voltages from A to G, G to B, and G to C, 347 for a 600 volt supply. And now, as the insulation breakdown occurs, the ground potential to G B now is lower, larger voltage exists from G to A and G to C. So you can track this line to ground voltage <coughs> along this path when the insulation is breaking on one faulty phase. This is a unambiguous, always available phenomena that happens in a distribution system. And it indicates to you that there is an insulation failure on one phase. So it will give you advance warning. It's a predictive tool for maintenance. So if you monitor the voltage and display the voltages, the maintenance staff will know that you have an issue coming up on B phase before it becomes a fault. Before it becomes a solid fault, you already have been tracking it when the insulation is beginning to fail. This is a, a phenomena that's extremely, extremely useful for tracking insulation failures, voltage to ground reference. Now, when the thing becomes a solid fault, C has been faulted. So now there is no voltage across this capacitor. The, this charging current uh, now disappears. The driving voltage across the other two capacitors have gone up to line-to-line -line voltage because G is at the ground. The driving voltage is now voltage between A and C. So line-to-line -line voltage drives larger capacitive current by root of three. And so two currents appear, which are 60 degrees apart. The two vectors are 60 degrees apart. C is faulted, so I have a voltage from here to B and a voltage from C to A. Those two voltages are driving this capacitive current, so the net current now becomes root 3 times root 3 ICO. So three times the phase to ground capacitive current will now appear as a return current in the fault. So people have, over the years, measured this current, and we can relate that to the size of the distribution transformer. So as a rule of thumb, a 1,000 kVA transformer has 1 ampere of this charging current. 1,000 kVA has 1 ampere. So 5,000 kVA will have 5 amperes. So as a general rule of thumb, based on the size of the cable distribution, you can apply this rule of thumb, which has been uh, validated by the practice over the years from, from the 60s, 70s, 80s, and up to 2000 now. So in exceptional circumstance, where you have exceptionally high voltage to ground capacitive couplings, then this would be breached. Otherwise, for normal distribution, you'd be OK. So as a designer, you would watch for any supplementary capacitors you may have added, voltage to ground current to supplement this charging current. You will have to add that to this value. OK, so in ungrounded system, therefore, the fault current is very small one or two or three amperes of charging current. And therefore, no tripping is required on the first ground fault. So no overcurrent relays need to respond, no ground current relays to respond. You can sit with the fault. It is not causing any consequential damage. And the power continuity, the load can, main, can be maintained. So these systems were installed in industrial distribution in the late 50s and early 60s, all along the industrial corridor in Detroit. On Highway 75, you have automotive plants on both sides. And these automotive plants used ungrounded systems in their distribution because the first fault was free. It did not have any consequential tripping. And then they found out that the first fault is not really as simple as just one voltage. It is accompanied by 
issue with locating that fault because there is no smoke, there is no fire, there is no evidence of a fault. They don't know where it is and they had to go look for it and they had to turn off breakers to see which feeder eliminated the fault. That means they are disturbing the production line which was very undesirable. So they had tough time locating these faults. And then they found also that these faults never came alone. They came in pairs because this, if there was an arcing situation, that arcing created a transient over voltage, exactly, and it created a second fault. So the transient over voltage buildup caused by the first fault precipitated a second fault, and that fault precipitated was anywhere wherever the insulation system was weak. It didn't necessarily come at the same spot. So it did not see see as an overcurrent in one feeder. It was seen as a line to ground fault in feeder one, line to ground fault on feeder two in some other part of the plant. The bonding impedance is in the path. The fault current is very low because the impedance in the path is high. And therefore, you would not get overcurrent devices stripping. So the two faults kept burning. There is a fault burning here. There is a fault burning there because the current levels were not high enough to get short time elements tripping or overcurrent elements stripping in instantaneous or even thermal overloads were slow in reacting to these faults. So they had experience with this kind of a sputtering arcing ground faults and it was resulted due to the transient voltage build up, build up on these distributed cable capacitances in the insulation system. So these uh, ungrounded systems uh, immediately went out of favor. So the distribution, distribution designers then said that ungrounded systems are unreliable. They are prone to double faults and therefore trip outs. Safety is jeopardized. You could have transient over voltages which can occur and disturb insulation. They are not cost effective because locating the fault is very difficult. Maintenance cannot be scheduled because double faults often cause unscheduled shutdowns and emergency repair, giving them extremely expensive repairs. And the loads are not prioritized anymore because the coordination is lost in case of double faults. You get two circuit breakers stripping independently. So any un existing ungrounded systems, therefore, deserve to be reviewed again, to be changed, because they have this operating issue. So people like Atomic Energy and automotive plants in Detroit have gone ahead and over the years gradually changed their systems away from ungrounded systems. So you should not be using ungrounded systems in today's circumstance. We have better technologies available to us and so on. So if you have any ungrounded systems, they should be reviewed. Okay, so the uh, pendulum went to the other side. Uh, instead of floating the system, now you're going to solidly connect the system. So early 60s saw the recommendation from the Canadian code that the systems have to be solidly grounded. And then they saw the consequence. It allowed the neutral to be distributed. Neutral is the white conductor, grounded conductor. It's identified solidly grounded conductor. So now you could supply that to feed single phase lighting and heating. Ground faults are easy to locate because they are accompanied by smoke and fire and smell and so on. So you knew where the fault was. You don't have to wait. You were immediately evidence of, of fault. Circuit breakers had to trip and isolate the fault and Lately, we have become aware of this problem which started to occur, danger from arcing ground faults where the fault currents could be substantially less than the three-phase short circuit current and therefore potential for the instantaneous element not to pick up and trip fast and their consequential potential arc flash hazard for people who happen to be standing in the front of this event, then they get blown away and often cause serious fatalities. So we have this issue of arcing ground faults, which is what we are going to discuss later part of the presentation. So it's since 1970, Canadian code has made it mandatory for us to have solidly grounded systems provided with a ground fault protection relay on the service entrance set for no more than 1200 amps and no longer a time delay than one second. One second is 60 cycles. In electrical terms, 60 cycle is eternity. It's forever. So if you let a fault sit for one second, it doesn't remain just a fault. It makes a fault energy melt the copper, blow that copper into ionic gas of molten copper, 
that gas rises in the compartment where this fault has happened and now you have a possibility of that fault migrating from just being a single phase fault to a phase to phase and a three phase to ground short circuit that has moved full disaster. It makes for a catastrophic damage and if that, uh, and the people are in front of this they are, they are done, they are toast. So, this sustained arcing which occurs in 600 volts because there is sufficient driving voltage to keep that arc sustained is the problem. It releases intense heat and mechanical energy causing severe damage and injury and the fault currents can be less than 50 percent of the short circuit current because there is voltage drop in the arc. So the voltage drop is estimated at around 100 volts at 600 volt level. So if you're 347 driving the arc, you take away 100 volts from it. What is driving the arc now is 247 volts. So your short circuit current levels are not at full short circuit. So if you have a 1000 kVA transformer with an available short circuit current of uh, 20,000 amperes, your short circuit current is definitely going to be less than 10. It will not be higher than 10. And if your instantaneous pickup levels are high, they're not going to see it. Yeah? Uh, one second uh, time frame yeah. you mentioned is only for industrial applications. It's for service entrance mandatory relay. Right? Not so, if, no, no, no. It's for service entrance ground fault relay. Our mandatory setting is one second. One second is 60 cycles. That's a long duration. So, what happens is you get this intense energy at this location of the fault. So here I have a, an example of how to quantify this damage and relating it to an energy. So to get the energy, you take the current flow. This is my fault current in the ground. I multiply that with the arc voltage to see the energy at the arc point. So I have amperes, volts, and a time. How long did I let it sit? So if I take the time in cycles, then I have amperes, voltage, in the arc and cycles. So let's say I set this to meet the Canadian code which is one second, which is 60 cycles of uh, 10,000 amperes of fault current, 100 volts in the arc and if I divide that quantity by 1,000, I will be 60,000 kilowatt cycles. 60,000 kilowatt cycles is like a 60 megawatt bomb that has just gone off in the switchboard for the duration of one second. That's enough to blow this thing completely, okay? That's why we experience and see these kinds of massive destruction in 600 volt switch gear. The protective relay set for one second doesn't do anything. So then you ask the question, what is the purpose behind Canadian courts one second requirement? The purpose is to prevent building fire. They don't care about your switchboard. The switchboard will be gutted, but it will prevent building fire. So the requirement and the insurance that is driving this requirement through the Canadian code is, is not for the equipment protection. It doesn't clearly protect the equipment, one second, 1200 amps. That's too high and too long. What it does do is prevent building fires, and that's why it's in there. So what we need to do is to protect people. We need to quantify that energy further and see how many calories are being expelled in front to expose the people to get them hurt. So in order to quantify it, if I take a a lab test and expose the panel board to control current and time, measure the kilowatt cycles and then observe what has happened with the arc. Then I see that 100 up to 2000 to 6000, the equipment can be still repaired. There would be punctures in the insulation, but there would not be any real serious melting of copper, no holes in the equipment enclosure and so on. But when you get past 6,000 kilowatt cycles, there is extensive damage that's past the repair point. Now you have to replace the equipment. Okay, so there is hole in the enclosure, there's extensive damage of ionized copper all over. The insulation system has been blown apart and now you are into replacement. So the quantitatively, that 60,000 kilowatt cycles has to be cut down by an order of 10. So you have to get down to 6,000 kilowatt cycle. And that can only be accomplished by controlling the time. It is the time that is the, 
that is your control. You can't control fork current. It's based on the system impedance and the ground path impedance. You can't control the arc voltage. That's the physics of the arc. Arc is going to take whatever it takes to bridge the gap. So the only thing a designer can do to protect his equipment and his people is to control the time. So the whole emphasis this afternoon to explain to you is that the arc flash energy is a time sensitive matter. So if you want to reduce the exposure to people against arc flash in calories per square centimeter at the working distance, you have to open the circuit as rapidly as possible. The marker is to get this down to 0.1 second or less. So six cycles or less is your target. Okay. So you have to be six cycles or less in the relay detection and tripping time of the circuit breaker. So let's look at the circuit breakers. We have molded case breakers and low voltage. They are a two to two and a half cycle breaker. So if you give a tripping contact to the shunt trip of the circuit breaker, it will take two and a half cycle to trip. Insulated case breaker is the other 600 volt breaker. We don't use power circuit breakers anymore, the metal frame breakers. It's insulated case breaker and molded case breaker. Then you go to the medium voltage, our breakers are vacuum breakers. They are also two to two and a half cycles. So we can accomplish interruption in 32 milliseconds. So if I add the relay now to it, my target is to be so fast that I will be maybe a one cycle or less detection of the arc plus two cycles in the breaker. Total time is three. So I will be down to 50 to 55 milliseconds altogether. That's the target. So all breakers are designed that way? All breakers are designed that way. The old SF6 breakers, which were five cycle breakers, are obsolete. We don't use them anymore. So air blast breakers, we don't, you don't use them anymore. So minimum oil breakers are, done, are finished. Air blast breakers are done. It's only the vacuum breakers. So vacuum breakers are up to 36 kV. And insulated case and molded case breakers are below at low voltage. So all these breakers are two to two and a half cycles. The only thing long, tripping time wise, is the load break switch. If you have a trippable switch, it needs to be of the same fast operating characteristics type, otherwise you can't use it for this protection purpose. So load break switches, you need to be careful in selecting what type of load break switch. It needs to be a fast operating load break switch. Now all mechanically operated load break switches, which are trippable, are a five cycle or more. So they are unsuitable for giving you arc flash protection. So our desire to lower this total time dictates us that our relaying systems have to be fast and that our opening time of the circuit breaker has to be also equivalent in few cycles. So if I look at the standards, this is the uh, buff book of the Industry Application Society, IEEE Standard 242, recommended practice for protection and coordination of industrial commercial power systems. In the article 8.22, it says, one disadvantage of the solidly grounded 480 volt system involves the high magnitude of destructive arcing ground fault current that can exist. This has been around from day one. So we have known that this is a problem with solidly grounded system. The second standard, which is recommended practice for electric power distribution for industrial plants, this is the red colored cover, which is our design practice. It says in solidly grounded system, the line to ground fault has the highest probability of occurrence and has the highest probability of escalation into a phase to phase or three phase arcing fault. So this explains and emphasizes the fact that a line to ground fault will migrate become phase to phase to ground and three phase to ground. And the line to ground fault is the high probability fault. So when you look at the literature, you find that this line to ground fault is probably an 85% probability, 85 or more. The phase to phase to ground, which evolved out of the phase, phase to ground fault or a direct three phase fault, the two like a bus bar falling over or a three phase fault are roughly 15% of the balance. So we have a high probability of line to ground fault escalating. So if you can manage this and prevent this, 
then you have scored a major victory in not having a high probability of arcing ground fault occurring in the first place. So the, the notion is that if we can now atten put attention to this high probability fault and prevent it causing an arc, then we would have covered 85% of the problem because it's not going to occur, it's not going to migrate, so therefore we will be safer. The clause further says that the danger of sustained arcing from phase to ground fault is also high for 480 and 600 volts because there is enough driving voltage and near zero for 208 volt system and that is our receptacle distribution. So what the standards are saying that the 120 volt 208 systems can remain solidly grounded. You are not likely to have sustained arcing at those voltages. So if you create a spark on the receptacle, it's not going to create a sustained arcing, it will blow itself out. But if you have 277, 480, now you have enough driving voltage to keep that going and you will have this sustained damage that's created by subsequent arcing. Now, based on the request from OSHA and the National Electric Code, they directed IEEE to investigate this issue of arc flash. So IEEE set up a committee, committee 1584, that was then given the task to give us some guidance on how to estimate this arc flash hazard and how to prepare. So they have come up with a document which has been in use now for quite a while that quantifies what is the arc flash current how much current is in, and then they have to put together the recommendation as to how to estimate this arc flash for various uh, situations for distribution. This 480, 1584 says that the, this arc flash which originated as a line to ground failure can migrate to become line to, from line to line to line to line to ground in roughly 8 to 10 milliseconds of the occurrence. In other words, the migration time is very short. So now you can see why one second time delay is forever. We are looking at milliseconds, not seconds, not cycles, fractions of cycles. So if you want to prevent this, we got to be really fast to contain the damage and lower the exposure. So what we need to do is to reduce the hazard frequency. So if I manage to somehow design my distribution system so that the likelihood of a line to ground was eliminated in the first place, then I could maybe design something that will give me pre-hazard warning or allow me to take some preventive action, then I will have impacted the mitigation. So in thinking, I got a three-step approach to my distribution system design. I will intrinsically design a electric distribution system that the likelihood of an arcing ground fault would not occur in the first place. Then I will take some action to see how I can mitigate against the balance uh, and, and in lower the probability further. Some guidance is coming from the 70E, the document that gave us the arc flash protection requirement in the United States. Similar language appears in the CSA standard Z462. The 70E states that proven designs such as arc resistant switchgear, high resistance grounding and current limitation are techniques available to reduce the hazards of the system. They point out to you the fact that your fault current has to be limited so that it will not give you an arc flash. CSA 462 adds further detail to this shorter clause by explaining this is the Canadian standard, that's the US standard. It says remove opening and closing of the switching devices, high resistance grounding of low voltage and at 5 kV systems and lower, current limitation and specifications of a covered bus with equipment such as techniques available to reduce the hazards of the system. So they are recommending insulated bus in switch gear to lower the probability of faults. The 70E has an informative annex. So what you see from these languages is that the initial reaction of the industry was being reactive. So if you have a, a fault, an arc flash, you wear the suit to protect it. So that they bulked up on the suit, they gave you values of how many calories you're going to get export, exposed to, and then you wear the clothing to shield and head mask, and by the time you are done, your fingers are one inch thick, you can't do anything. So that was the reactive approach and what they are suggesting now is a proactive approach and a preventive approach. 
So the language in the codes are changing. The language in the guidance given by the CSA 462 is changing. And what we are going to see is design considerations. So it is now going to impact the designers. They are being asked to design electrical systems intrinsically with no hazard. Okay? This is a change in paradigm. This is a change in the shift. They are not saying don't wear PPE, but they are saying intrinsically you make the electrical systems so that people will not be exposed to the energy level that they have been exposed to in the past. Okay? So here is the language. Design should facilitate the ability to eliminate the hazard. Eliminate the hazard or reduce the risk by reducing the likelihood, reducing the magnitude and severity, enabling achievement of an electrically safe work condition. So this language, when it goes to the court, the court is going to say, were you aware of these procedures and, and methods of reducing the hazard? This is a new paradigm. Yeah? People have not asked us in the past, do you, were you able to design an electrical system which was safe to use? Yeah. Up to now, we have said, okay, we have reacted to it. We are going to wear PPE. That PPE is not going to do it in the future. They're going to say, oh, you didn't reduce the risk. This is about eliminating the risk. This is coming from management systems, Z1000 and so on. So we are now being asked to do electrical safe work condition by reducing the magnitude and severity, reducing the likelihood. This is a new paradigm. And then the same document here goes on to say incident energy reduction methods. And they have three or four different methods listed. The primary ones are arc flash relay and high resistance grounding. This is a phenomenal change in the standards. Arc flash relay and high resistance grounding. So what does high, high resistance grounding do? High resistance grounding is going to lower the fault current so that no arc flash hazard exists on a line to ground fault. And what is that level today? 10 amperes. If you lower the hazard current, the electro current in such a high resistance grounded system to less than 10 amperes, you are not going to have an arc flash hazard from a line to ground fault. You will have it from face to face fault, but you will not have it from line to ground fault, which is a high probability fault. So for the purpose of line to ground fault, you have taken control of it. And the control is through the HRG, high resistance grounding. And then for the balance, which is face to face condition, where you will have an exposure to arc flash, the tripping time is the key. You want to sense the ground, the f occurrence of an arc and give an associated trip signal to the circuit breaker to zap, open it quickly. So the technology today is doing this with optical sensing. So the face-to-face -face faults where arcing is initiated, fast detection and tripping will reduce the arc energy and therefore reduce the hazard risk category. So now if I do it really fast, I could dispense with my category three or four suit and just go with shirt sleeve category 0 or 1. That would be sufficient if my relay is acting fast enough and I will not get any significant burns. Yeah. This is for face to face faults. So the first one is for high resistance grounding will take care of line to ground faults and the arc flash protection applies to face to face faults where arcing is initiated, fast detection and tripping will give you the protection. So you need combination. One alone is not going to give you arc flash limitation. The arc flash limitation has to come by combination of an optical arc flash sensing and fast tripping. Circuit breaker is required and grounding will be controlled by using a ground fault relay. So it's a combination. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For uh, high resistance ground, does it just have any ground? The High resistance grounding will eliminate the high fault current which will flow when you have a line to ground fault. Yeah, when, when you start using the grounding, the purpose is to have low resistance so the current can go to the ground. Well, then your response is to that current by overcurrent device, by short time de device, or by long time device, LSIG. Yeah. So LSIG is going to sit there, wait for it, the value to come up so it can pick up while your fault is burning. 
So LSIG alone with a time delay exposes you to a tremendous amount of damage and people are blown away because the energy is so high. So LSIG function by itself is not giving you protection for people or control the damage. It will give you coordinated tripping, but your equipment is finished. Yeah. So the, the damage reduction will only come if that LSIG was instantaneous and the setting was low, not four times, ten times full load current. If the setting was below 100% and it was instantaneous, then you will get that protection that you want, provided it was less than 0.1 second altogether, right? So the damage reduction and protection is coming from the exposure due to the time. So if you control the time and make it fast, but now you have to worry about how you're going to coordinate if everything was running instantaneous, zone interlocking. So now you have to think about zone interlocking to make sure they are selective and they are coordinated and they will protect in less than six cycles to achieve this protection, right? Okay, so here we have a new relay that we are working on. It's called Architect, Arc I Tech. It has arc flash mitigation detection in one millisecond. Reduction of arc flash energy by fast detection and tripping minimizes total clearing time and ensures fastest possible reaction time without nuisance tripping, combining light sensing with some other AND function. So some other AND function could be existence of current. It could be existence of uh, pressure because the enclosure construction of our metal clad and low voltage switch gear ensures that the, there is compartmented construction. So if there is an arc, there is going to be a pressure buildup. So we can combine detection of arc to provide nuisance against uh, trip, nuisance stripping, reliability increase by these AND functions. And this technology now can enable us to do this. Yeah? The first one, the one millisecond detection, and the what uh, grounding resistance, because the higher the resistance, the slower the detection. It will occur for places where it is a phase-to-phase -phase situation, because you have controlled the current for the resistance by the resistance for single phase to ground condition. And that current is going to be less than 10 amperes. So you will not have an arc. So the arc is not formed for single phase to ground fault. The arc is only formed for phase to phase insulation failure. And that you are going to detect very quickly as soon as it occurs. So this is for solidly grounded devices? It can be for any device, for any system grounding. Doesn't matter. It can be for ungrounded system. It's the phase-to-phase -phase arcing that will be de detected by the optical sensing for ungrounded and resistant grounded system. But for, resist for solidly grounded system, all three are covered. So for solidly grounded system, you can have an arc with uh, single phase to ground fault. You can arc, arc with line to the ground fault. You can have an arc with phase-to-phase -phase fault. So on resistant grounded system, you have eliminated the arc possibility with the first ground fault. You will only have arc with a phase-to-phase -phase condition. Or you can have an arc which was face to face to ground. And those would be covered by this optical detection, right? Still, from my experience, the more yeah. you increase the grounding um, resistance or yes. impedance, yes. the detection becomes slower and slower and slower to a point where it starts to be detected. No, but you have other supplementary means to detect the zero sequence current flow very sensitively. Because supplemented with this is a zero sequence sensor ground fault relay, which will see the ground current right from 100 milliamps. So your slowness of arc buildup is not a consequence because it's not expelling and giving you energy exposure until an arc forms. So arcing is where the energy exposure becomes very high because the dissipation has to be very large. It builds the pressure, it throws the copper, and then the things blow up. So before you get there, you can have a long duration leakage that you can monitor and do something about, which will give you advance warning. So in fact, this impedance is helping you to delay in your circumstance of not having you exposed to arcing situation for a, until it becomes a face-to-face -to, -face to ground serious short circuit. Then you need to respond immediately. So this is the immediate response, yeah? Yes, 
Absolutely. Yes. Yes, people are working on solid dielectric devices. Yes, absolutely right. Correct. But wherever you have open bus construction, you will need some means to protect people. Because the Yes, it does. Absolutely. Quite right. So this is the arc flash detection that combines light sensing and with other elements to give you this module. So this would involve uh, control power, a display of uh, these optical detection devices into correct, and then combining them with uh, fiber that connects it to the relay. So I have this uh, new relay that is under development now that will give you input from 12 optical uh, sensors. It has provision for uh, direct input, uh, digital <coughs> input from AND, for AND function from other devices that can be combined to give you a comprehensive uh, arc flash protection. And these uh, kind of reactions now demonstrate, here's the light arc intensity detected by the relay in a switchboard. The operating time is uh, very fast, one millisecond. It gives a trip signal to the breaker. The breaker trips in the following two cycles. So there is a reduction of arc flash energy by fast tripping. That includes a very uh, small incremental time for detection. So if I take consequential effect of all this into account, I have now, I'm down here, less than 50 milliseconds. This is time in operation in milliseconds. This is exposure of energy due to that fault. I arc energy in I squared T function, which is ampere square seconds. So if I plot this, the conventional devices are exposed to cable fire energy level, copper fire energy level, and so on along this scale. That's a square function of current. But if I keep the time low, I'm in this protected zone where the exposure will not cause significant damage. Uh, one millisecond plus 50 milliseconds or so for the breaker. So I'm down at the less than 60 milliseconds of operating time. So fast tripping reduces energy exposure and damage. And I can combine them with uh, arc sensors or pressure sensors in this arrangement so that I can install these relays in uh, comprehensive switch gear which is compartmented so that I can manage the tripping. So there is an application uh, support required here. So we have an application team at the iGuard which can give you suggestion on where these sensors and how they are connected and how they are integrated in an overhaul control scheme for the circuit breakers. Because on the line side of the breaker, you need to trip the primary side. On the load side of the breaker, you need to trip the next line side breaker. So if I'm down in the feeder level, I'll trip the feeder breaker. If down on the main bus, I'll trip the main breaker. And if I am on the line side of the main breaker, I have to trip the primary side. So there is a bit of an application required here to locate these sensors and tripping contacts out of this relay to correspondingly affect the right circuit breaker. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's coming. Yeah, one second. Here is the, uh, the pressure sensor addition to the arc, arc flash relay. My uh, clearing time with uh, overcurrent device, if I am using a conventional inverse overcurrent relay, could be uh, 3.1 second, giving me incident energy uh, exposure of 37 calories per square centimeter, requiring me to wear a very um, you know, size category 4 suit. If I am reducing that time down by a tenth to uh, lower values for with uh, instantaneous elements, I am down to 5.4 calories. But if I use a optical detection or combination of pressure and optical detection, I'll be down to 1.3 calories. So my energy exposure reduces as I in lower the total tripping time. So these uh, pressure sensor uh, and functions with uh, arc detection is a very effective approach to lowering the incident energy. No significant damage to persons or switch gear the switch gear which can often be returned to use after checking the insulation resistance. If your time is more, then you have consequently more damage, um, more uh, exposure to energy. And if the, uh, if the duration is uh, really uh, half a second, then you are uh, into serious uh, exposure to energy and damage to the equipment. 
So it is all based on reduction of time and uh, operating these uh, circuit breakers very quickly by uh, fast acting relays. Here is an uh, example of uh, pressure buildup. So I have fault current in uh, waveform A. This is an asymmetrical waveform giving you uh, AC plus DC in a typical fault. So I have a fault current. This is the arc voltage drop. This is the voltage across the fault, arcing, uh, arcing fault. So B is, a, is the arc voltage. And then C is the pressure buildup in the enclosure. So it follows the arc by a few milliseconds. So it's behind by about 5 to 8 milliseconds. And you get the pressure buildup in the enclosure based on the size of the enclosure and the seriousness of the arc as soon as it happens. So you could employ the pressure as an AND function in order to give you an assurance that there is an existence of an arc. So here is an example of the pressure sensor I was mentioning before. It detects the pressure wave generated by the arc. Uh, detection time is 8 milliseconds. And you can apply this in combination with the uh, optical sensor, which sits in the enclosure so that the uh, total tripping time would be around 8 milliseconds. Uh, yes? Pass it around. Oh, sure. There, uh, there is a sample relay coming around uh, for us to take a look. This is uh, uh, straight off the uh, uh, fresh uh, development. So now, as you said, uh, there were two elements to this whole function, right? The first was limiting the current so that the arc doesn't uh, start in the first place. And the second was, uh, what if the arc did start? Then we had to apply fast detection relays. So let's go back to the resistance and see what we're going to do when to delay that arcing. It would be applicable to low voltage and medium voltage systems. So our definition of medium voltage would be up to 36 kV or even 44 to some extent, so which is unique to Ontario. And past that, it will be 69, and the utility systems are all solidly grounded. So our industrial distribution and limited distribution, which will not be solidly grounded, can be 44 kV and down. So 36 kV normally is what people use. And when you limit the ground current, now there is no arcing with ground faults as you have with solid grounding, because we are controlling the current. No over voltages as you have with ungrounded systems because it's not floating, it's not drifting away. You are tied to the earth. It is not effectively grounded. Effectively grounded is solid grounded. So now you are tied to the earth. So the voltage escalation with this is going to be root three times line to neutral voltage. So our insulation system now has to withstand line to line voltage. So if I am 4160, my cables, drives, breakers, everything has to be rated for 5 kV, no more. I don't need more than 5 kV to ground because my system is not going to go ungrounded and my resistor is going to leave it at line to neutral voltage across it, which will give me line to line voltage to ground. So, so therefore, this will now be prevented and I can use this to maintain power continuity. So wherever there is a power loss consequence, this will be very beneficial because I can maintain power. My power doesn't have to be cut. Circuit breakers don't have to trip if I limit that ground current to low value. So it has been applied in process industry, all, kind, all kinds of processes. It has been applied to water, wastewater tra treatment plants, hospitals, data processing. In the, in the last few years, that has also migrated to commercial buildings. And we see commercial building applications specifically for standby power because the standby power needs to be a high reliability distribution. So people have been using high resistance grounding on their standby power while they have solid grounding or their normal distribution. So we have seen a mixture of high resistance grounding with solid grounding. And I'll show you an example when we integrate standby power into a building distribution. So how do you? Control the current, you simply control it by having a, an impedance in the return path. So here is my bonding conductor at the bottom. And in the bonding conductor to the neutral, I have added and inserted an impedance. This is a resistor. Driving voltage is 347, neutral to phase. And this driving voltage is now going to cause a circulating current here, fault current to flow when I have a solid ground fault, which is now limited to 5 amperes 
So Ohm's law applies. So 347 divided by 5 equals the ohmic value I need in my resistor. So the designer now has full control of the fork current. He can say, okay, I want to limit it to 8 amps or 5 amps or 10 amps. And he will choose a resistor to suit. And that will limit the fork current. So you cannot exceed that value if you have a solid ground fault. So then there is no arcing. So there is a fault, you will simply alarm and continue to operate. And there is no risk to anyone, including people. So if there is a screwdriver that slips and somebody is in front of it, he will create a ground fault. Only 5 amperes are going to flow through his screwdriver. And there is no arc blast. He is not exposed to any blast of energy. The only problem he will have is what if his screwdriver falls on three phases or two phases. And for that, you need that other relay. Okay, so our mitigation philosophy here would be to reduce the probability by going high resistance ground so that it doesn't happen in the first place. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, by adding the grounding uh, resistance, right. the entire neutral point starts to flow. Yes. The neutral, will yes, triangle will start to shift. You are right on the ball. So which means the neutral cannot be the white wire that you distribute because that is a, a intended wire with a ground potential. So you cannot use a white wire and distribute the neutral. So the restriction here is that this applies to three phase, three wire circuits, not to three phase, four wire circuits. So then you ask the question, how many loads do I have? at 347 that deserve to have the neutral. And you will make a short list and say, OK, it's my lighting that is 347, mostly. And single phase. And single phase. So therefore, for to serve that single phase lighting load, you will now dedicate a small lighting transformer, which can sit on the wall and serve your 200 kVA lighting load. And the rest of the distribution will not suffer distributed neutral cost and the associated issues that come with the distributed neutral. So your cost of the distribution is not going to be lowered. And the limited distribution for 347 will be further benefited because your transformer is so small, the short circuit current for his panel is going to be less than 14 kA. So you can give just a simple lighting panel for 347 without having to penalize it for either 35 kA or 50 kA interrupting capacity, circuit breakers. So there is a supplementary benefit that comes out of doing lighting on its own with a separate lighting panel. So this is the approach that is very cost effective, and it is getting popularity. A lot of people are now saying, OK, I have lighting load, so I will give a dedicated transformer for it. The, it has a Y or a delta primary with a solidly grounded secondary. So 347, 600 on the secondary with a, either a delta or a Y primary. That does it, right? So three wire distribution on one side, four wire distribution on the other. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Is there any reason why you go for the, uh, the size and the electro current of the resistor is dictated by three ICO. Remember the three ICO, the capacitive charging current. That resistor current has to be equal to or more than three ICO. So the 5 ampere is a convenience because our transformers are usually 5,000 kVA or less. That is the only reason for 5 amps. But if you chose to go 2 amperes because your transformer is smaller, that's entirely satisfactory. It's dictated by cable charging current. On the counter, if your distribution is extensively large and your driving voltage is large because you have a 4160 volt system, you are 2400 volts now. So if that is the case, your 3 ICO may be more than 10 amperes. Then you are obliged to have a resistor which will be more than 10. So you might go to a 15 amp or 20 ampere resistor. So your net ground current now crosses the 10 ampere border, right? And you are not no longer HRG. You are into low resistance grounding, LRG. So then you are outside this permission that code has given you for continuous operation. With a larger amount of current, you are now required to trip. But you have no sensitivity to arcing because the current is still limited. You're still tens of amperes, not thousands of amperes. So there is no ex exposure to escalation of damage at the fault location. So you can take your time to time coordinate conventional relays and trip satisfactorily. So the difference is 
that higher currents require you to go trip on the first fault. Lower currents allow you the option of not tripping on the first fault, but that's your option. You can say, OK, well, I know the current is small, but I'm going to trip anyways. That's uh, entirely up to you. So we can design relays that will give you first fault trip or give you relays that will give you alarm on first fault and then give you monitoring for the second fault. Because second fault would be a serious fault. You have line to ground to line condition. And then add the optical element to it, then you have fully covered the situation from exposure. So we have added this resistor to allow us to control this ground current. So now that we have added the resistor, my net current is now going to be 3 ICO from the distributed capacitances and the IR from the resistor. And these two currents are 90 degrees to one another. This is leading current, leading by 90 degrees to the resistive current, which is in phase with the driving voltage. So now my addition is going to be a vector addition, giving me IR squared plus 3 ICO squared square root of is my fault current. So if I have 5 amperes of charging current, I added 5 amperes of resistive current, this current is going to be 7 amperes. So 7 amperes of fault current allows me to maintain power and operate the distribution continuously with, a, with one ground fault. So the rule of application is that this IR should dominate and should be slightly higher than 3 ICO. As a minimum, this could equal 3 ICO. So you want to be certainly not less. So people have to have a feel for how much 3 ICO there is in their distribution. So we give you assistance in how to estimate the cable charging current. It's in the application guide on the iGuard website. The iGuard website is at the bottom of every page, www.i-guard.com. It has an application paper that shows you how to estimate the cable charging current. And it came from the original paper, which was written in 1979 by Mr. Baker. And his paper title was Guesswork Free Estimate of Cable Charging Current. <laughs> Very straightforward title. It's a landmark paper, and it has been now 1979 to 2015. The Industry Application Society, uh, the committee, Petrochemical Industry Committee, would be very interested in another paper from any young man who did an undergraduate, postgraduate work at the university to come up with a supplementary paper that updates the data in that paper. Okay, the cable materials have changed. The we have gone through years of experience with ungrounded systems, converted into resistant grounded systems, and now there is a time for a new update to that paper, and they would be very interested in it. For the time being, you can refer to this website and get information on how to estimate this 3 ICO, where you are concerned with the value. So in this case, with the resistance grounding, I still have the delta change. As you said, the thing is going to float. My neutral is no longer sitting at ground potential. I'm not distributing it, but it will be in line to neutral voltage on the neutral. It doesn't do anything to the transformer. It sits there. It doesn't do anything to the load. The load will get the three phases, so you can maintain power. And you can monitor this voltage to ground. So. The. Yeah, the single phase loads are not connected to this. They will go through an isolation transformer, and they are on the secondary side where this, the neutral will be solidly grounded. So single phase loads can only be line to line connected. They will not be line to neutral connected. So neutral is not distributed. So the Canadian code says uh, in the 2012 version, which is still applicable until the end of the year, and then we expect a new version to come next year. 2015 will arrive in January. So it says at the moment in the section 10, clause 1102, article 3, where a neutral grounding device is applied on systems which are operating at 5 kV or less, provision shall be made to automatically de-energize the system on detection of a ground fault unless the ground fault is controlled at 10 amperes or less and a visual and audible alarm or both are clearly identified to indicate the presence of a ground fault. So what it says in a small paragraph in a 500 page book that you could do so. And it has such a large consequence but it's buried in the book in a small section. Okay, This is what the code gives you permission to do this. 
So this effectively becomes the definition of high resistance grounding, this level of 10 amperes. The, the language in National Electric Code in the US is slightly different. They allow you um, your discretion and give you references to uh, IEEE standards to see what level you will be at. There is no specific level specified, but in Canadian standard, there is a level specified. The voltage is specified, 5 kV, 10 amperes, no more, for continuous operation. So ours is slightly different opinion on this. So in the future, uh, one can think of energy balance at higher voltages and submit a request for revision to the code. And this is another project and a young engineer can undertake for a postgraduate uh, master's thesis as to what could be done at 15 kV or 25 kV. What would be uh, sustainable without escalation? What is appropriate? What level of ground current? Because there is an energy balance between the resistor dissipation of energy and the arc dissipation of energy. So you can optimize this to see where the escalation doesn't go forward with time. So we may have some further guidance uh, after further research is put into this. This is the language today. OK, so the uh, third book, the green book, this is the standard 142, green colored cover. It says, here are all the reasons for limiting the current by resistant grounding. It reduces burning and melting effects in faulted electrical equipment, such as switchgear, transformer, cables, and machines. Limiting the current in such a way so that it doesn't damage the lamination in the motors and lamination in the generators gives you a big impact on maintenance cost of these devices. Because if you burn the metal, because high fault current flows, it causes steel melting, then you are into a not just rewind, but you are into re-laminating the machine. That means the stator has to come out of the installation, go back for re-lamination. This is a very high cost consequence. But if you limit that energy so that the steel doesn't get affected, your copper insulation has been damaged, you can repair it. I was at a water treatment plant along the lake shore. City of Toronto has many such across the lakefront. One of them uh, takes the raw water from the lake, processes it, makes it into drinking water, then pumps it out for storage. The day I was there doing something else with their 27 kV switch gear, the uh, 5 kV circuit breaker supplying a pump tripped. So the site engineer immediately ran to see what has caused the trip. It was the ground element on the motor protection relay. So then they looked at the current in the relay. It had tripped on 40 amperes of ground fault. They looked at the, uh, he came back to the site engineer's office and said, well, should I reclose the breaker? The guy says, no way. There is a ground fault trip. That means there is a problem. I have to come and look at it. So they, he came down. They did not reclose the breaker, did not try again. He had the covers removed, and he saw the stator, and the end was full of dust. So the, this 5 kV motor was not looked after in the previous maintenance cycle. It had accumulated dust from the atmosphere. So they had to vacuum the dust out. He still didn't see anything. So he said, now we have to remove the rotor. So they pulled the rotor out. Of the mo and the, then he has the second round of vacuuming. And then he saw the small little nick on the insulation on the end winding to the core. There was no physical damage to the core. And it was only the slightest amount of damage where the break has happened, enough to cause 50 amperes to flow, 40 amperes to flow. So he was able to get that repaired and reinstalled in one shift. Imagine the consequence if he had a solidly grounded system, 5 kV, that stator would have blown apart on a ground fault. Then it would be that machine is not working for six months until I get a replacement or rebuild of the stator. But here that machine came back in service in one shift because he only has to repair the damage insulation. No damage to the copper, no damage to the lamination. So there is a powerful impact, very significant impact on lowering the damage by reducing the current done by resistant grounding. And it's applicable to medium voltage as well as low voltage. So it reduces mechanical stresses in circuit because the current doesn't cause the forces that would happen with solid grounding. 
if you have a through fault which does not create high values of current then it doesn't affect the bracing in the transformer doesn't affect the bracing in the switch gear reduces shock hazard to people because the straight ground fault currents in the ground return path do not create a potential increase it reduces arc blast or flash hazard to personnel who may have accidentally caused it to happen or in close proximity to the fault current so they would not get hurt and look at the date this is 1991 this is a lot before OSHA and NFPA got involved and got interested in art flash. The IEEE standards had recognized this right from get go that there is an issue with solidly grounded system and the fix is to control the fault current. Okay? So this has been along except it's gathering momentum now because the regulations are changing to us and they are saying you now have to be proactive and preventive. And proactive and preventive means you got to design systems differently than what you did in the past. And this is a design exercise. So high resistance grounding helps ensure a ground fault current of known magnitude. You're going to control the current, which is helpful for relaying. So now you can put sensitive ground fault relays so that you can see and know where the fault is. High resistance grounding provides the same advantage as ungrounded system, yet limits the steady state and severe transient over voltages associated with ungrounded systems. And there is no arc flash hazard for a ground fault on 480 and 600 volt system as there is with a solidly grounded system, since the fault current is limited. So these are quotes from the Buck book and the Red book of the IEEE, which is our practice, North American distribution system design practice. So how do you actually do it? you need a resistor. So resistor can be configured as a single element which forms the resistor or it could be configured as a reflective resistor. So you have a step down transformer here, single phase transformer. It could be a 2400 uh, primary, 240 secondary with a low voltage resistor that give you the right amount of reflected current to control the let through here. So you can be a transformer with a resistor or a straight resistor. Of course this adds a layer of uh, further reliability reduction due to the availability of the transformer, which is not present here. So these are identical electrically. This or this is the same performance. Is the question of the cost and reliability. This gives you a lower cost and better reliability. So people use NGRs, neutral grounding resistors. If you don't have a neutral point to go to, you have to create one. So to create a neutral ground, you have a uh, auto transformer which has six coils which are interconnected with transposition so that it gives you a star point. This star point then can be the place where you can connect your resistor and this transformer then makes it, uh, makes your locating resistor independent of the main supply transformer. You can put this zigzag connected to the three places, three buses, anywhere uh, which is convenient to you. Alternative to zigzag would be a two winding transformer, a Y delta transformer where the delta provides a path for circulating current and then the Y point gives you an access to the neutral to go to ground or a open delta connected transformer, two winding with a Y connected uh, transformer going to ground and the uh, controlling resistor here controls how much current is going to flow in this path. So those are the three alternatives. Uh, these two are more expensive than this. This by far is the more cost effective approach to applying a resistor. Now the zigzag is constructed <coughs> um, with the six coils, so two identical coils on each phase. Uh, phase A uh, cross coupled to phase B, B is coupled to C and the C is coupled to A, that's the name why zigzag. It's like uh, you know, a doodad, it's the same thing, there's no particular meaning. The fact is this is a grounding transformer. So when you say grounding a transformer, it means it's a zigzag connected auto transformer. The uh, impedances um, uh, offered by the zigzag is simply the let through impedance of the transformer and the series impedance in the resistor path now controls the current. While there is no fault, the magnetizing current flows equal amount in the three phases adding to zero. So it's sitting there with uh, zero current in the neutral and until a fault happens, then the electrical current is controlled by the resistor. So the combination of the uh, impedance of the transformer and the resistor is what controls the electrical current. 
So if I'm the distribution designer now, I could say my reliability is a lot better with this system. I have power continuity, no trips on ground faults. 80% of the faults are ground faults, so no trips on ground faults. It's safer, no arc blast or flash hazard and exposure to people with arc blast. Cost effective because three wire systems are cheaper than four wire systems. This is a serious cost reduction. You are not just affecting the cost of the conductor 25% less, but also the conduit sizes, termination cost, CT cost, bus bar cost, all through the whole system. And you don't need the G element on the LSI G breaker. You LSI breaker, G is separated to look at the current through a zero sequence sensor. So the, there is a serious cost reduction achieved in going to a three wire system. And this is a new paradigm. People are saying, if my single phase load is very small, just for the lighting, why do I have to penalize my entire distribution system with 3,000, 4,000 amp bus bars? They are expensive. So they can remove all that. Industrials have been doing it for from the beginning, but now the commercials are saying, OK, I want to cost reduce my distribution. They can cost reduce it by not having the neutral distributed. Keep the distribute neutral to the loads which are require neutral, limited load. So you can save a lot of money by not having a four-wire distribution through the whole place. The schedule maintenance now, faulty equipment can continue to run. You schedule your shutdown, so you have noticed an alarm today. I will say, OK, well, today is Monday. My next opportunity to maintain that will be when my shift shut down, or maybe on the weekend when there is no plant operation. So I can schedule my repair to suit the timetable. Okay, I don't have an urgency immediately because there is a fault. There is no consequential damage. Fault current is low. So I can schedule this. This was observed when Go Transit changed their Go Train generators to resistant grounding. We have 50 of these trains in the Toronto. They are commuting, uh, taking commuters uh, back and forth from their residence to the workplace downtown. So all trains are coming into the city, then they go back, and then they are using a 1,000 kVA generator on board to feed the convenience, operate the lights, operate the doors, operate the heating, wind, HVAC equipment. And they have limited the ground current to 2 amperes. And as a result of the 2 amperes limitation, they have observed their maintenance cost has plummeted down because the repairs are very inexpensive. They can detect ground faults early, so they have not been exposed to double ground faults ever because they can take out the faulty compartment out for repair. They're not running the train with the faulty compartment that exposes them to a double fault. So they have uh, had a major impact of uh, lowering maintenance cost that we saw by using this high resistance grounding on the train. The loads are prioritized. Overcurrent condition is maintained, and selective second fault protection is available in the relay so that it, you can maintain uh, observing the currents beyond through the zero sequence sensor. So this gives you no obstruction to coordination. On a solidly grounded system, if you apply a ground fault relay, you have to worry about the downstream overcurrent device. And often with the high level uh, fault currents, those don't coordinate. So you need, need to now lift the ground current uh, tripping time. And as soon as you do that, you lost your protection. Now the circuit breaker is going to be dead by the time the, uh, the delay is all over. So time delays uh, become difficult, and coordination becomes difficult in solidly grounded systems. OK, so high, high resistance grounding summarizes by saying, OK, I'm going to limit the current to 10 amperes or less. It provides me service continuity on first ground fault, prevents arc flash, allows fault currents to be located without de-energizing. And here, we need to give the uh, operators assistance in locating the ground fault, because they know they have a fault on the feeder, but they don't know where in that feeder the fault is. So the, the technique of pulsing enables them to physically locate that fault very very quickly, effectively, without de-energizing any circuits or without opening any doors or compartments and do it safely while the system is energized. So this approach of high resistance grounding can be applied on three-wire circuits at 480, 600, and 4160. 
once you go past 4160, it may not remain high resistance. The value may, the value may lower so that it is now low resistance grounded. The let through current has to be higher to overcome the 3 ICO. Below 480, our voltage is 120 to 8. There is no discussion. It's a four wire circuit and a solidly grounded circuit. So the application of high resistance is limited to these three voltages, 480, 600, and 4160. Particularly where unscheduled downtime is expensive and cannot be tolerated. So if you have such a critical distribution where people cannot tolerate circuit breaker stripping, then you should seriously consider high resistance grounding. And that would be the case for almost all of the process industries. So petrochemical, metal mining, pulp and paper, and pharmaceutical, food and beverage, all sectors will benefit, uh, particularly in food and beverage. Uh, if you trip out uh, in the process, your whole batch has to be thrown away because your power was interrupted. The bakers, fillers, the pharmaceutical people, they all uh, suffer from this outage problem. So this is an obvious one. But beyond that, hospitals don't want anything tripping. They were life support systems have to be kept energized. Data centers don't want anything tripping. They're, they depend on that processing for their survival. And then uh, generating stations, the station service uh, cannot tolerate the uh, outage. So wherever this unscheduled downtime is costly or cannot be tolerated, uh, high resistance give them give them a major benefit of power continuity and safe operation with no arc flash hazard. So we have done the resistance grounding, but we cannot stop in resistance grounding. We need to go a little bit further. We have to sense the ground fault, allow people to take some corrective measure to fix it by um, locating and giving them assistance and giving them an alarm so they can acknowledge and know that they have a ground fault because it will not be evident otherwise, or give them systems which would trip on ground fault. So we need to go further than just uh, resistor. The approach is to take, the approach is to take, we are coming up to about halfway point. So I think maybe we should take a 10 minute break uh, at this point in time. Give you, uh, so 10 minutes to take a, stretch your legs and take some coffee and liquids and refreshments and we'll resume uh, in 10 minutes.